Welcome to another Kundalini Conversation. My guest today is James Dearden Bush. Welcome, James. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome. Hi. Oh, so I'm so excited for our conversation today. James is a Kundalini experiencer, of course, with over 13 years since your awakening. Maybe even some spiritual experiences prior that we might get into, but today you offer Kundalini support in uh, you know meetings. Uh, you're a healer, shamanic breathwork facilitator, a musician, a YouTuber. Uh, today we're going to dive into your journey, some of the uh, the insights and the wisdom that you've gathered uh, over the years working with others going through Kundalini awakening. I'm sure we'll touch on you know some of the uh, creative pursuits as well that I'm sure have been inspired by your process. Uh, prior to our conversation, you were mentioning that you also got uh, a big undertaking, uh, a healing center that you're, uh, uh, I guess, leading with your partner. And so we'll get into that as well. We'll see, uh, you know, what service means to you, what it's like getting your hands dirty, you know, running a, a big uh, facility and whatnot. Um, but to begin, I want to share with our audience a little bit about how we were initially connected. Um, I mean, I guess it goes back almost maybe even over 10 years. I didn't know you directly, but there's a video that you put out called The Message, which involves uh, a, 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 an excerpt from a talk from Terrence McKenna that you creatively put together with some music, uh, DJ Shadow in the background. Um, really powerful video that I probably listened to 30, 40 times over the years uh, about the psychedelic experience, about uh, you know being creative, about prioritizing your direct experience. Now, these are words from Terrence McKenna, but I want to thank you for putting that together in an artistic way that was, you know, really, uh, really just mind blowing, mind blowing message. And so, like I said, I would listen to that talk so many times, and I didn't know that, of course, um, you know, I didn't really go to the your channel and check it out, but. When I connected with you over the Kundalini topic, I thought, oh, it was you who put out this video. And so looking at your work, I found that, uh, you know, you've got a lot of psychedelic uh, experience and that has got a lot to do with your Kundalini awakening, myself as well. And so we can get into that today and we can talk about, you know, the influence of psilocybin, maybe talk about yeah. some of the uh, the nuances around the, the experience of psychedelics. Of course, it can be, you know, really confusing because on one hand, Kundalini awakening, even if you're sober, it's so hard to believe. Um, and then if you say, you know, oh, well, it involved psychedelics or drugs, well, people can easily dismiss what you're talking about and say, ah, well, you were just on drugs. It was a hallucination. You know, you're a, you're a junkie. You know, don't talk about this Kundalini stuff. You've lost your mind. Um, and so I'm happy to be here with you together. Uh, so we can relate on these points because I know a lot of other people out there have got psychedelic experience that have, of course, influenced their spiritual awakening, and they may have some questions, they may be confused, they may feel invalidated. So let's discuss this together. We'll see what comes out. So on that note, let us know a little bit about you know how your Kundalini awakening experience began, and yeah. you know bring us up to speed to where you are today. Okay, yeah. Uh it's a long story, obviously, but I'll I'll try and yeah, do in like in a nutshell version. Um yeah, so I started exploring well, there was a series of synchronicities after reading a book called The Tao of Physics, um, which is a really good book which parallels Eastern mysticism and uh, modern physics and at the time I was really quite into physics especially um, astronomy and things like that and I read that book and it just triggered something in my mind about like how if these ancient mystics knew the same thing that modern physics are just discovering it just triggered this kind of thought in me of like uh, a real interest and it and it what it did was spark an interest in the psychedelic experiences I'd had as like a teenager when I was doing them kind of recreationally, but it made me see like 
I don't know why that book in particular, because there was nothing in it about psychedelics, but it just triggered something in me. And I, and I was like, there's something in the psychedelics that I was missing when I was just doing them younger. Um, and so that led me to explore uh, psychedelics for a couple of years and mushrooms. And Ter I came across Terence McKenna almost immediately from searching mushrooms on the internet back in the day. So I had a really um, deep dive into Terence McKenna's stuff. And I feel like listening to his work, especially at that time for me, which is about 14, 15 years ago now, it was just massively mind expanding for me. It's like taking a mushroom in and of itself, really listening to him sometimes. Um, so yeah, I went on a journey with uh, psilocybin mushrooms for about two years. And we're, we're back in 2008 here. That's when... Um, and Terence McKenna talks about the heroic dose, five dry grams of mushrooms taken alone in silent darkness. And over that two year period, I kind of built up to that experience. I did um, smaller doses for a while and then built up to that. And I had a huge breakthrough experience when I did the five dry grams. I've, I've done a YouTube video on this. So if anyone wants to really dive into that whole experience, they can check that out. But it was a really powerful experience and I ended up transforming into different animals um like yeah it was absolutely incredible and meeting these certain beings that felt like they were initiating me in a certain way and on the back end of that journey I I'd transformed into like part human part tiger at that point part lion and I was feeling all the power of what it feels like to be a tiger and I was growling uncontrollably and roaring and purring and it was like the animals energetic field was like superimposed over mine or dancing with it in some way like these two fields had come together um I now view that as like a massive connection with like my one of my main power animals and like shamanic from a shamanic understanding um but towards the back end of that I also had an experience where it felt like my crown was completely open and all this energy was, was just pouring into my body I was full of bliss I was getting past life memories like downloads of certain information about things um so I feel like I I wasn't really aware of what had gone on I thought that was just a, a mushroom experience um but looking back on that I think that might have been a top-down kundalini awakening that occurred in that experience um because after that I was a completely ch changed person when I came back from that, that experience um synchronicity just poured into my life in the most wild ways uh, there's an example that I've spoken about before on some of my videos but so after transforming into anim animals in that experience a few days later I was on the street working I used to be a fundraiser for a charity and a woman I think she was like a homeless woman or something like maybe a little bit psychotic but she just walked up to me in the middle of the street grabbed me by the arm started shaking me and she was saying the animal spirits are rising the animal spirits are rising and these kind of really bizarre things that seem to link into that experience just like flooded into my life. That's one example of many of these things. And my life started getting very, very strange. It felt like in that time, like the whole universe had like pointed its focus on me or something. It was a very strange experience. And that built up to about six months after that mushroom experience. I was, I'd, I'd had, um, quite bad posture and some damaged damaged muscle muscle tissue in my body from when I was 18 I'd uh, had a chest infection and it lasted a few years um it was hospitalized at first and then it kind of carried on for a couple of years and I would like be doing this continuous coughing which I now realize is linked to some emotional trauma at the time but I didn't realize that so anyway fast forward to the, the six months after that mushroom experience and I watched a video by Bruce have you heard of Bruce Lipton Mm -hmm. yeah so Bruce Lipton had done this presentation called the biology of belief and it was talking about how our beliefs affect the the expression of the cells basically um epigenetics it's known as um and the environment that the cells are in affect the expression of the DNA and anyway after watching that I just got this thought, thought coming through of why have I still got all this pain and trapped emotion in my body if basically the vast majority of my cells have been completely regenerated 
like because your cells regenerate i think every seven years practically every cell in, in your body's new by the, in that time frame and so i was thinking why why am i still holding this pain why is my body still damaged and it just hit me that it was like the emotion and the memory and the kind of I was revivifying that constantly in my body and like telling my body, oh, my back and like these constant um, emotions that had never been let go of and the trauma that had caused that chest infection. And I just kind of got this all in one moment. And I had this vision of my soul essence being put into a brand new fresh body and immediately that body conforming to these sort of pain structures within my body. So that night I laid down in bed and I basically just started this heartfelt dialogue with my cells. I was like saying, look, I know we came here in this life for a reason. We can heal this. I'm sorry for all the pain I've caused you. And like, yeah, just into this really deep dialogue, literally talking to the cells in my body. And I felt it for a moment completely healed. Like all the pain was gone. It was literally for about 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. And I felt this kind of like, and saw kind of this like energy blueprint just like coming down on my body and I felt completely healed for that moment and I think what occurred then is I healed my body on the energetic level but then that takes time to play out in the physical which I'll get into now which is kind of what happened so I woke up in the middle of the night after that experience and I could feel energy moving up and down my leg. It was like these little spiral emotions at first and like pins and needles. And I felt this band of pins and needles around my leg as well. And I woke up to that sensation and I was violently sick. Um, And so, yeah, I was like, wow, this is, when I got back into bed, I was like, this is really weird. This is strange. Um, I'd never felt anything like it before, like internally moving. And then I woke up the next day and this energy was stronger and it was moving around in the body and it started to move through the regions. And then over a period of about a week, it just built and built up. It was starting to want to move my body in um, what are known as Kundalini Kriyas, which I'm sure you're you're aware of. Um, It started wanting to move my body and it, and it was dancing me as well. Like the energy was, if, if I surrendered into it, it would like dance me in this, these most elegant ways. And I was kind of like watching this and it, it was blowing my mind. I th- I thought at the time I was like, I've triggered some kind of healing and this is what's going on. I, I was aware of Kundalini because I'd, I'd read some books um, many years before that had spoken about it. Um, So it started to dawn on me that, that this was like a Kundalini awakening. And anyway, after a week of that, it got to this peak point where I was lying down in bed one night where the energy was just going so strong through my body. I felt felt like these big channels moving around my spine. The the energy moved out of my head and then just went into my temples. And I felt like my whole crown chakra open. It was like thousands of little petals, just like they say the thousand petaled lotus, which I thought was a metaphor until I actually experienced the thousand petals opening and this kind of spiraling pattern. Um, and there was this big purple flash in the room and I could see like this portal open up and there were these other, there were these beings coming through this portal and they were all around me. It was like, the feeling was that they were, they were coming to watch this. It was like they were ancestors or something coming. It was like this big moment of celebration for for them. That was kind of the feeling I got from them. It was, yeah, really strange. Um, and so that that point was kind of, yeah, I feel like that was like the the energy from, from the bot. You know that that was a bottom up. That was the bottom up part of the of the awakening. Um, then I had a very interesting experience. Like a couple of days after that, I got into this massive fear. I'd been telling all my friends about this, and I got massive fear about. Oh, they're gonna think I'm crazy. Like everyone's going to think I've just totally lost my mind. And I was starting to get a little bit fearful of the power of this energy in my body and what it was doing to me. It felt like I'd lost control of my body in a certain way that the, there was this, yeah. I mean, anybody who goes through this, the, the force and power of this energy when it awakens in the body, like words can't really describe this. Like it, it's very difficult to put this into words, how unbelievably powerful this is. It's like a, tsunami has just been unleashed in the body and it's just like raging through the whole body or at least that's what it was like for me and anyway so I was in this fear 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 and I kind of went into this panic energy and I felt all the sparkling and all these these spiraling movements just like drain out of me and then I felt it come down like the central channel 
and I felt the these tubular-like serpent energies just curl around each other about maybe about three inches below the base of my spine, and then the whole thing was shut off, and I was like, whoa, what, what, what's happened? And I started to freak out a bit that I had, my fear had aborted this healing process, basically. So over the next week or so, I just meditated again every night, just saying, look, if this is my path, I'm ready to walk it. And I was talking to the cells again. And then one night, I, I can't recall it exactly, but the energy just like burst on again. And it stayed on since then. So that was, that was 13 years ago. Um, and after that point, the energy just got stronger and stronger. And, and my physical health kind of collapsed, basically. I was bed bound for about three years with this, this process in the early days because it was so strong through the body. Every, the, it was showing me how the emotional trauma is stored in the body. And as it was unwinding these blockages in the body, I'd have like these drilling sensations or um, like burning and I mean, endless different sensations. But as it would release certain things from the body, I would visually see like in my third eye, like, like the... Uh, tra trauma if you want to call it that from, from what had occurred like so some event in my childhood or in my teenage years and it would come up and I would see this image and then I would like see how it was linked to these other image these other things it was like it was pulling out these threads and like pulling out the root and then these other ones would like come out with it if, if that kind of makes sense mm -hmm. um, but the energy was so strong and overwhelming and there was so much being cleared and purged all at once all this stuff that I'd suppressed for years and minor things that I thought was minor really big things that I'd suppressed um, and not really felt at the time. It was all coming up, past life memories. Um, yeah, just absolutely insane. And the system couldn't deal with it. I couldn't, I couldn't, pro it was, it felt like it was almost too much to process and I became extremely fatigued, very weak. Um, yeah, I ended up, like I said, being bed bound for quite a number of years, just lying in bed with the energy, just like raging through me and doing all sorts of stuff. And then it got to a point after a few years where it started to ease off a little bit in the intensity. And then I had like another big journey um, of kind of spending like three hours a day just moving with the energy and the, the careers would just be clearing and it would literally like realign in my spine, realign in my posture. Um, yeah, one thing that I always noticed often is just how connected the whole system is. It would clear something in my wrist, for example, and so there'd be clearing and then it'd like something would clear in my head and I would just like seeing how it was all interlinked and there's just one muscle. I mean, it's the myofascial tissue that links it, but just this one thing. Um, and yes, yeah, so I had a massive journey of kind of literally like having to rebuild all my strength, like kind of learning to walk again. I was just shuffling around and could barely walk and stuff at one point and I had to build my health up physically and get out more um and that was yeah that was another big journey with it all the while having these kind of very um yeah one way i've described my kundalini awakening it, it was kind of like being on an i haven't personally taken ayahuasca but um i obviously know the territory somewhat from the mushroom experiences but it felt like i was just on this ayahuasca <laughs> like constantly 24 hours a day seven days a week for years um like this absolute deep clean of the soul on on every level emotional physical mental spiritual um clearing it up and yeah it was i i had i had a period of like thousands of lucid dreams over a few years really dove deep into that whole lucid dream space and maybe we can touch on that at some point in the conversation but a lot of interesting insights from exploring the dream space and a lot of healing in the dream space as well um yeah i think and and then yeah more recently i've kind of stepped into my dharma if you want to call it that like my path out in the world um helping other people with the kundalini process as you mentioned i do shamanic breath work i hold group sessions uh with my partner i do one-to-one -one group shamanic healing as well with people uh, group shamanic breath work healings with people um and yeah I'm, that, that's kind of a little short version of a of the story of to sort of where I am now yeah wow fascinating so many interesting themes have come up there that we'll explore throughout our conversation um just briefly where are you physically located in case people are interested in connecting with you in person yeah. yes I'm in Halifax which is in West Yorkshire in England okay great great so uh 
for those that are interested, even right now, the links will all be in the description for James's work. But uh, let's keep going in our conversation here. Wow, there's so many interesting themes have come up there that I can relate with very closely. Um, you mentioned the the top down awakening, yeah. Uh, that you know, like you said, occurred on the mushroom trip. Mm -hmm. Um, top down awakening. Can we talk a little bit about what that looks like? Uh, the differences, um, because I know many people may have had a top-down awakening. It doesn't look like the more classic bottom-up rising, which you described later in your experience. Yeah. And they don't think they're dealing with Kundalini when in fact they very much are. So can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit about um, a, a top-down awakening in general? Yeah, I mean... For, I, I could speak about my experience with it um for sure it was it it was it was a yeah the majority of my my experience and my kind of knowledge and my uh understanding is is the bottom up really because that's been the the primary uh journey for me with this over all, all those years but yes the top down um in that mushroom trip it was it was basically just my entire head felt complete energetically completely opened up there was energy just pouring in like streams of energy just pouring down through flooding the body with like bliss my body actually went partially see-through and i could see this like golden orb like orange light in my chest um and i think Yeah, after that experience, when I came back from that, as I sort of touched on, things were very different. One example, which I don't know, it might it's a bit of a strange example, but I used to drink alcohol back then. Um, and I remember drinking after that mushroom experience and I couldn't get drunk. There was part of my consciousness that was completely sober, like watching this other drunk part. It was very weird. And, and I feel like so that, that top down, it just like very quickly shifted me shifted me like upper level in some in some way it's difficult to describe but it it, so it was this very rapid um shift that from that followed that top-down experience like and yeah it at least my experience with it this was this rapid shift in consciousness as, as opposed to the bottom-up journey as being this deep purging kind of getting into all the shadow all the darkness all the things that were repressed all the emotions the yeah like literally everything like i did a video on sexual shadow as well there was a period where it was like really diving into all this these aspects of sexuality that i maybe didn't want to recognize existed in me um and, and stuff like that but yeah i think the top down felt like just this big shift quickly i don't i don't know if that yeah, it's, I don't know if that resonates with other people who've had top downs. It's it's, it's not an area that I've gone that deep into. Yeah, um, it, it resonates with me definitely. Um, you use the word shift, and that's what I would say as well. The the major qualities of a top down awakening, at least that I've experienced and seen with others, is the shifts in perception. And you yeah, describe yeah. this like ability to there was a part of you that was able to observe your drunk body but wasn't drunk yeah. um you know that witness mode um that comes online like in a very deep way almost even when you're drunk it's like it doesn't leave it's sustained yeah. um once that top opens up at least that's been my experience mm. and so that was the way things happened for me like just like you the the, the crown opened and a lot of energy poured in um, I didn't have the word energy for it. I just felt incredible spaciousness. That's how I perceived that energy to be spacious. But unlike you, you're from the top down, it, it seems to have descended into your body. You described like an, an orb in your chest. For me, it felt like it was just solely about the head, solely about the mind. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have much respect for the body at this time. I was looking at teachings that said out oh, of the body is just a vessel or the yeah. body is an illusion. Conscious is all there is looking back. Now I can see, well, my body was so jacked up. My nervous system couldn't handle any of this energy anyway. And so that's why I was stuck in my head. Um, and so that 
at least in my experience and with many others, it causes a person to become ungrounded, a lot of energy up in the head. Is this something you see a lot with people that are going through Kundalini awakening, being ungrounded? Yeah, for some of them, yeah, very, very ungrounded. I, I think, I think the journey with Kundalini, there's, there's a return arc in it. It's like sometimes we have to be blasted out into that um, kind of cosmic, completely mythic cosmic view to, to then, to then bring that back down and pull that into the body and then emanate that out into this layer of reality. Because ultimately, we, we chose, from my perspective, we chose to come to this reality for this physical experience. And I think if you, yeah, it's it's very valid to get out there and touch the touch that like heavenly energy. But if you constantly want to escape this, you de- you're denying what is, which is not a not spirit not, not spiritual. Also, the, you know, one of the main things about spirituality is the is the presence and acceptance of what is and being there with that. Um, so yeah, that is a. I don't know whether I'd say it's a pitfall. I mean, it can be if people get stuck in a kind of ungrounded loop with it, but equally it's, it's often just part of the a part of the journey, the expansion before sort of coming back in a new space. Um, there's that is it a Zen that Zen saying that says, um, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And it's like you're coming back, but you're a totally different being, you're doing the same activity. But the inner landscape is completely changed. I right. think that's the kind of that's the kind of point with it. Um, so yeah, there's the ascension and then the descension and then the emanation. That's like my feeling right. of it. Very well said. Yeah, I, I I completely agree with what you've shared there. So you described, and I I do agree. There's a necessity of you know we expand. But then we do have to come back down and continue to chop wood, carry water. However, for some people, like in your experience, they have this major expansion, whether it's on psychedelics, meditation, spontaneous or whatever, major expansion of energy. They become ungrounded and they feel like they're crazy. And like how you said, you know, my friends are probably going to think I'm crazy. Um. And this can sometimes for some people, I guess I, I was, I had a very close call with, you know, being a, sent to like a, some sort of psychiatric institute during a similar phase. Right. But some people, um, they do end up, uh, you know, being labeled, stigmatized, hospitalized, um, forced to take medication. You know, we call this like a spiritual crisis, yeah. um, you know, even the woman that you described who you you know she was a homeless woman may have been experiencing some sort of psychosis but mm-hmm. in that experience she was sensitive to something spiritual within your field yeah yeah so, so clearly there's a spiritual overarching element to some what we would call mental illness or some people that we would call crazy yeah yeah sure do you have any comments about this fine line between I'm having a spiritual experience versus I think I've lost my mind and I need to, or I'm forced to get help from a Institute that doesn't understand. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, Joseph Campbell said the, uh, I think he said the schizophrenic is drowning in the same waters in which the mystic swims with in delight. And, I mean, that sums it up perfectly in a certain way. Um, I think that's the grounding part. Like, if you're not grounded into the body, if you're not grounded into this reality as well, like in shamanism, the shaman has a foot in both worlds. Mm. Like, and um, what is in the Bible, like be in this world, but not of it. Right. It's like, if that grounding into this level of reality is not there, then that's when that's when you can completely get lost. And I've had periods of time like what what I would look back and think I was kind of a bit lost in the mythic. Um, like everything was, and it, it feels amazing. <laughs> it did to me, like in that kind of mythic space where you see in this whole mythic nature of it, and it's and it's true. It's a it's a it's a um, it's kind of a layer of reality. But it's it's more like this kind of I don't really know how to describe it. Maybe like a cartoon or, or something over it. Not yeah, I don't know. I'm not not describing that exactly yeah. how I want, but yeah. Um, but 
yeah i think there's there's practices that people can do really basic things like spending time in nature grounding into the body barefoot um spending time with people who maybe are not on the spiritual path as well and just kind of yeah doing more normal things to help you ground for a little bit if you if you really feel like you're flying out there and not not um yeah not not managing to hold it together right great advice so simple but can really bring a lot of relief to some of probably the most horrific pitfalls of the spiritual journey yeah uh, just walking in nature being with people who <laughs> are normal grounded mundane worldly people not judging them for being that way but actually embracing them for being that way um yeah. very simple things but yeah definitely very powerful um so the psychedelic theme yeah so like we were saying in the beginning you know um i mean we share that in common there seems to be a lot of people that are experiencing genuine spiritual mystical kundalini awakenings and whatnot uh, coinciding with their psychedelic use of course psychedelics mm -hmm. are becoming more popular um, there's a lot more research it's, it's entering more into our culture uh, um, and so I think this contributes to the uh, it's one of the factors pushing the ascension along um, but of course it's very easy to just say oh well that was the drugs um, and invalidate the experience or have the experiences invalidated so from the psychedelic the psychedelic theme can you say something about how they are valid essentially just to, just to, for those people out there that are yeah. unsure of what they're going what they're going through you know yeah. you mean how the psychedelic experience is valid or the uh, the kind of kundalini working through the psychedelic experience or... right I, I, both actually i think i think both are, are valid you know can you can you share a little bit about that yeah yeah so i think the psychedelic experience, the Kundalini awakening through the portal of a psychedelic experience, let's say, why that's valid. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess I would just say, like, why isn't it valid? I mean, it's, it's just as valid as any other thing. And that um, in a soul's path in, in this life, if the psychedelic, ex if a, a mushroom experience, for example, was your initiator into that um uh preceding kundalini awakening then that's just the way it was meant to go for you and these these um i'll, I'll only really speak on the the plant-based ones like the mushrooms ayahuasca but these are part of nature they're not they're not separate from us they're not separate from the the biosphere like I've heard people say, oh, it was like an, un it's an unnatural, in quotes, awakening if you go through. It's like, yeah. but you wouldn't say it's unnatural to eat spinach or drink water. It's just the same thing. They are, they're a part of nature and they are very powerful medicines that can help you shift through a lot of things very quickly. And therefore you've leveled up, so to speak, and, and a, a more open container for this energy, the Kundalini, to flow in. I feel like when a being gets to a certain, it's like this energy is waiting to flow in. It's like a, it's like a stream wanting to move through a dam. And when you get to a certain point, that dam is energetically broken, and the water that flows everywhere then like just enters the the body. And so I just think it's absolutely valid to have a psychedelic experience and and then have a kundalini awakening. Um, and I guess that answers the question of why psychedelics are valid in general. Um, I think. From my perspective like they are they are very powerful and they should be treated very sacredly um and i personally i i i didn't do them for 12 years until very recently i had a few i've had a few one gram mushroom mushroom experiences recently like in, in about a period of three months i did four journeys but now taking one gram is like <laughs> taking about three and a half like say like many years ago because i'm so much more like open to that already and another thing i found is when i took them when i was younger and i used to take them i'd feel like weird like feelings in my body and stuff and that, i just didn't feel that at all it felt like i was more energetically compatible with the frequency that they were helping bring in if, if that kind of makes yeah. sense um so yeah i, I think 
yeah, they're a, they're a very valid medicine and certain people who are in certain situations they can be extremely helpful for. Um, I mean, yeah, some people do have to be careful, obviously. If you're, if you're one of those people we spoke about earlier who's, not, who's struggling to be grounded, whether you're having a Kundalini awakening or not, taking something that's going to chuck you even further into those waters is probably not a good idea. Um, but for a lot of people, we're so shut down in this culture in so many ways, emotionally, um, energetically. Uh, but I think they're a wonderful, a wonderful medicine. And yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You shared some great insight there. Of course, they're valid. They're from nature. They're, yeah. they're you know, they're, they're put here for a reason. I mean, if we look into the origins of, of, uh, of yoga, for example, there's a strong uh, argument to be made that, uh, you know, mushrooms in particular are, are influential. We see it in also in, in, in Christianity as well. I mean, it's, it's a little, some would say it's fringe, but it, it's there's some strong evidence there, and it only makes sense. You know, these things, you you know, you, you, you can take anybody off the street, you give them five grams, they're gonna have an experience. Um, yeah. it's gonna it's gonna change their perspective of themselves and the world. And I'm also very happy that uh you shared about tre treating them with with respect, um, but as the sacred, you know, medicines that they are. Um, yeah. for a while, I was very reluctant to speak about my psychedelic experiences, especially doing this work, mm. because I didn't want people to just recklessly go out and start taking them thinking that, oh, you know, this guy took them and I'll do it too. But I think they're medicine. They should be treated with, with great respect. And so I appreciate your, your insight there as well as, of course, if you're not grounded, it's, uh, it's not, uh, necessary um, from that Terrence McKenna uh, talk that that you had created that video, yeah, there's a quote that I wrote down here, and he says, "I studied yoga. I wandered around in the East. I was fast shoveled by beady eyed little men in dotis. I know the whole spiritual supermarket and rigmarole, and I find nothing there to interest me on the level of five grams of psilocybin mushrooms in silent darkness." I mean, that's where the pedal meets the metal. That's where the rubber meets the road. And it was actually that talk that uh, inspired me to do a, a, a five gram dose, a heroic dose. Must have been probably about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago now, but uh, life changing. And it didn't involve a significant Kundalini awakening per se, but mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, opened me up for the awakening that would follow, I guess, in the next year. Um, yeah. But overall, yes. I mean, there's a lot of powerful spiritual practices, you know, breath work, like, like you do um, energy healing is all very powerful, but uh, psychedelics are no joke, very powerful, very valid, but of course should be treated with respect. So thank you. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, your perspectives on, on psychedelics and your experience. Um, you mentioned dream healing. Mm. One argument that we can make was, you know, I mean, some people, sorry, let me backpedal for a second. Some people may say, oh, if you had a spiritual experience or a healing experience in a dream, ah, it's invalid. It was just a dream. But talk to us about some of the healing work that you've done in your dreams yeah yeah that would be humorous because i'm i feel like this is a dream on, on from a certain perspective it's just a collective one um yeah so lucid dreaming i mean it was kind of unexpected and i i i'd i watched a film called waking life many years ago which was a richard linkler film it's i definitely recommend it for people to check out if they haven't and that got me interested in lucid dreaming. And I've had some very minimal experiences with lucid dreaming. But once Kundalini awoke, about six months in, I think, I just started to have continuous lucid dreams every night. And it would be like a lucid dream into a lucid dream into a lucid dream. For just for massive portions of the night, I was fully conscious that I was dreaming and, and asleep. And that was really beautiful because at the time, my physical life was an absolute you know it was devastating I was in constant agony 24 hours a day seven days a week I would wake up 
shuffle around the house a bit, eat some food, go go to bed for hours. So to have this kind of space open up when I was asleep was, uh, yeah, it was just, it was very beautiful. Um, and there is so much healing in the dream space that can be done. I think I've given this example in, in a video before, but well, there's a couple of really powerful examples actually I'll give just so people can get a feel of what's possible in the, in this, in this space. So I had a series of dreams. Um, the first dream I was at my junior school, which like for young, the, the young, young children's school. Um, and I saw, I, I realized that I became lucid. I knew I was dreaming. I was looking around and I realized that there were all these children's bodies buried under the ground of the school, which to me is a beautiful metaphor for what happens to the uh, essence of a child in the, in the modern schooling system for the most part it is quite crushed. <laughs> um, certain parts of it, especially like the more creative right brain kind of flow. And so I was digging up all these children, pulling them out and I found myself as well and I pulled myself and they were like coughing this mud up and I was bringing them all around then the then the night after I had another lucid dream where I was where I found another child in, in a forest um and the same thing she was buried underground and I dug her up and then the third night and the third dream and this was the really significant one but I think there's this series of dreams building up to this um I found myself as a little baby like a almost fetus, but or a newborn baby, and I was at my parents' house by a bin, and so the, again, there's this strong sim symbol symbology of like this feeling of like deserted or being rub rubbish by the bin, you know, like at my parents' house, and I realized in this lucid dream that it just became totally apparent to me that this was from when I was at first born. And I got taken away from my mom and put in like an incubator because I was uh, a premature, premature birth. And it was, I was just feeling into this whole situation of like, oh my gosh, like that trauma is still, still present. And so in the lucid dream, I was like, right, I just knew what to do. I saw this little baby version of me. I picked it up from the bin, held it and just was pouring all this love into it from my heart. And the whole dream just filled with light. And I woke up just from that, just in this most beautiful energy. And it, it was like, this was a, a soul retrieval, I believe. Like that aspect of my psyche or however you want to call it, it got fragmented at birth. And in the dream space, I found that psychic aspect and was bringing it back. Um, and that was massively healing. And another example, um, well, I'll just say this actually. So, so many of these lucid dreams, I would be, you, lucid dreaming is amazing and you can fly around you can walk through walls you can um, I'd have lots of experiences where like people would be attacking me in the dream and lucidly you could fight them off and you can do that and you've got like superpowers you can like blast armies away with your hands and stuff like that but also if you just turn and send love to these beings that are attacking you in the dream I've had experiences of like being conscious and like oh I'll just give them love and they just all came around and like started hugging me and it turned into this massive, beautiful hugging experience. And I think that's just such a, a lesson for, for, for how you can operate in, in this in this life. Um, the clarity in lucid dreams is incredible. You can, it, the more you focus on something, it becomes extremely HD, like a leaf. You can see all the little veins and um, which suggests that it's the level of conscious attention maybe that, that makes things so real. In this reality like when we're awake we, I, don't, I don't know the mechanisms for it but it was pointing to something there for me of like you just you kind of like really draw on it through the body into like a real uh heightened state of uh, attention on this little bandwidth of reality so yeah um and characters from my childhood would appear in these lucid dreams and i'd, I'd recognize that they were certain aspects representing certain things in me um and there's some interesting stuff like waking people up in dreams. So from my perspective on, on all these, this lucid dreaming, there's like various layers of dreams. I feel like there's a layer of dream where we're in our unconscious and like all the characters are like reflections of us, like I was just talking about. But I do feel that there's a layer above that where we're entering into the collective consciousness and the characters you're interacting with are actually those people's consciousness asleep. Either that or that part of them that's always asleep. 
because I've woke people up in what I perceive to be that lair and they're literally like walking around, they look drunk and I've grabbed them and like held them and said, like, you, do, you're you asleep, you're dreaming. And they come around and their eyes light up and they're like, oh my gosh. And you can go into such deep conversation with them, like about like the level we're talking here, you know, you can drop in. But if you do that on a lower layer with characters, it's like, it's almost like an NPC in a game. They start freaking out and they don't know what to say. And it's a really weird distinction between these two layers of dreaming that I found. Um, and then there's layers above that where it's almost like DMT space. You're like flying through space and portals and like meeting giant psychedelic jellyfish and all sorts of stuff in that space. Um, but yeah. The, oh, so there's one more thing I'll just say. Yeah, one more because this was a really powerful experience and taps into the sort of question about the healing as well. I had an experience where I was lucid dreaming and I was a deer running through this forest and there were these wolves chasing me and the wolves caught me, dragged me down and they were eating into me and biting me. And I started panicking and I was kicking them off and trying to defend myself from these wolves. And yeah, I guess this was a semi-lucid dream. I, I kind of realized that I, that I was asleep and I, I was like asking for help and i heard this voice echo through the whole dream and it just said surrender i was like all oh, right yeah and the moment i surrendered all the pain that had been these wolves tearing me apart turned into absolute bliss it was absolute bliss to be being ripped apart from these uh, by these wolves and, and i just totally softened in the dream and as it got to the point where i was dying in the dream i, I could I experience leaving the body of the deer and like moving up and then i woke up um in this reality and was just like yeah it just felt I was the kundalini was just like so blissful in my body and it showed me that like death is death is like the the degree to suffering in death is the degree to which you hold on right like I've observed this if you watch a nature documentary you watch an animal there's a point when they've been taken down when they just go into that surrender that's the wisdom in the animals and, and that dream was showing me that they've surrendered and and it's and it's a beautiful experience they've surrendered into what is completely and the pain goes and the and it's like this letting go of everything um so that was a powerful one i've had look I, I could go into like entity and attachments in dreams i've got there's a lot about that kind of thing as well um so yeah i <laughs> don't know if you know Want me to totally. dive a bit deep from that? Or, well, we, we can't yeah, I well. think uh, I think we've got to go there. But wow, those are some some really great insights and and powerful uh, dreams you shared. Yeah, for me, dreams have uh, has been the playground for a lot of interesting experiences. And and I guess really what uh, my intention is to show is that yeah, just because it happens in a dream doesn't mean that it doesn't have real world implications of course it, it does just like the psychedelics um not just uh illusions or anything like that very very valid experiences why don't we uh discuss a little bit about uh entities and your um uh, your experiences with them uh, in the dreams maybe even outside the dreams what's going on yeah. with the entities yes yeah, so during the kundalini awakening i've had quite a few experiences of entities being unattached from my body it was mainly in this time when i was as that i mentioned earlier i spent like i don't know six to seven years pretty much every day moving with the kundalini energy for quite a number of hours and there'd be times when it would be moving and like clearing something um i remember one time it like doing this career and like my neck just cracking and i just saw this little like being just like and it like flew in front of me and then just shot off and it was like a little gremlin type energy really weird and kind of comical um i've had experiences in the careers where i could feel this smoky like energy being like pulled off my back um the one in the dream which was probably the most powerful entity unattachment experience i've ever had because I feel what's happening just before I go into that is I think like these entities um, and, you you know, I'm open to multiple interpretations of these. I'm happy if somebody wants to view that as like an aspect of your unconscious or whatever, that's fine. I personally believe that they have a level of independence, just the same way that like a friend, one of my friends does on one level. He's an aspect of me. We're all we're all part of the one. But he's got an, an existence independent of me to a, to a certain extent. <laughs> um, and I feel they are like feeding on certain frequency energies. And, and as the Kundalini raises that vibration, they no longer can stay attached. And they, they basically 
yeah, they, they can't, they're vibrationally in, uh, incompatible with that energy that, that this whole process is moving you forward in. But the one in the dream, I was in a warehouse uh, in this dream and there was lots of people like really drunk on alcohol and maybe drugs as well. And I was walking around it and to me, that was giving me an insight of when this attachment had occurred, basically. And if somebody came up to me in the dream space who I knew from, from when I was younger and I used to go out and drink and stuff. And he was kind of like shouting at me and it was really weird energy. And, and anyway, I, I ended up looking down and this thing just like came out of my stomach. It almost looked like that the thing of aliens, but it was kind of made out of smoke. And, and it came up and it was just like, like the Dementors out of Harry Potter or something. It was like feeding and like sucking all this energy out of my face. And I was totally freaking out, obviously. <laughs> but then I, I, I kind of became lucid and I was like, oh, right, I'm dreaming. And so I called out in the dream for, because um, I work with, like like I said, with the shamanic uh, tradition with like power animals. So I called out for one of my guides and this um, feline being came and just like, as this whole thing was going on, it passed me this bag and said, this is a jag bag. Now, I have no idea what a jag bag is. Like, a, I looked it up online afterwards. But anyway, I knew exactly what to do with this jag bag when I got it. And I threw it on the floor. And it basically like sucked this entity in. And it like sucked it in. And then I felt it like coming out of my stomach. And I noticed that there was a fire in the corner. And so I carried this bag over to the fire again, just knowing exactly what I had to do dropped it in and burned this this energy basically and I woke up from that dream and I was curled up in the fetal position in my bed and I just felt this energy just like heave like getting heaved out of my stomach and I had this big like sound and big release of it so the, the that dream experience and that clearing in the dreams like spilled over into an energetic release in this reality um so it's totally yeah, like, as you said, it's got real world effects and clearing emotional blockages and things. Um, and yeah, I've also had this thought, the more time you, be the more you become lucid in the dream, like you're creating a bridge in some ways so you can pull in a bit more of that dream consciousness into this reality in a bit. Like there's a two way bridge being created and that can maybe help with your creativity or thinking um, more abstractly and things like that. Incredible. Yeah, the entity conversation is it's a difficult one to have um, mm -hmm. for multiple reasons. Of course, there's different ways that we can interpret it. Yeah. Um, but some of that stuff can be pretty scary for some people. I mean, for anybody, especially if they're like super dark, like what you described, like, you know, a Harry yeah. Potter Dementor type character just coming out of your stomach. And like, it's it's pretty freaky stuff. But, um, you know, I've had my own experiences with um, these types of things as well. Um, alcohol in particular, I mean, we see it in the word spirits or alcohol. I think the Arabic word for alcohol even means spirit itself, like al cool or something in Arabic. Um, just the other day, somebody was mentioning, you know, somebody in their family was, uh, an alcoholic and it was, it's quite literally like they were a different person like quite literally a completely different person, um, which is troubling for many people because, uh, you know, it's it's such a strong contrast. But I think the entity explanation can provide some some insight for what's going on there where an entity has um, taken control of that person. Now, whether it's a separate autonomous entity in the way that you describe, like a separate being, or it's a darker aspect of their own consciousness, we're not sure. But um, difficult stuff, difficult stuff. Um, do you have any general insight for people that feel that they might have some sort of unwanted entity attachment? Mm. What can they do to find a little bit more... Uh, safety and and sovereignty over their over their field yeah um yeah i'll just quickly just say before i answer that as well i think like in terms of how we define it whether it's an aspect of our psyche or an independent thing i would often say to people or, or if i was having a session with someone i would just kind of tune into like which version of that is going to most serve this person right now like because it, yeah. like the fact that it's like an external thing could bring up way more fear for someone. Um, 
yeah, I had a friend once who took too much DMT over a short period of time and he had an experience where these beings were saying to him, you're on, you're, you, you're on the wrong path. And they were like shouting at him really aggressively. And it really freaked him out. And in that scenario, I, I kind of realized like for him, like I was like, yeah, but that could just be a part of yourself that is telling you to stop doing this. You're taking too much. And you, and, and I think that sort of settled him. So yeah, the, the situation and just whatever works for you as a person, I think is, is a good, a good way to, to look at that. Right. Um, yeah, in terms of if someone feels they do have an entity attachment, um, I mean, there's there's methods in in shamanic practice where you can have if you reach out to someone who's a shamanic practitioner, there's ways for doing entity um, removals. Um, if you're having a Kundalini awakening, I feel like it's it's going to bring some of that stuff. At least for me, like it naturally just started to I've just started to experience these being removed. Um, ultimately recognizing that the only power they have over you um is the power that you're giving them and the like if we if we're going to say that they are in some way feeding on that low vibrational energy then you have the power to shift out of that space and therefore they have nothing to nothing to drain nothing to feed on and, and they, they, they they don't yeah you've got the power like we have the power um by working on our own energy working on our own inner state through spiritual practices, whatever works for the individual um, to move through that. So just knowing that, yeah, you've got the power really, I would say. Right. Great advice. I like to think that a human being, especially a human being going through some sort of spiritual awakening, um, very, very evolved. Human beings in general, even, you know, some of the lower um, people in a lower state of consciousness, I think human beings in general are very, very evolved beings. And it's only that we forget how powerful we are that these little gremlins and whatnot can start to take advantage of us because we forgot that we are a human being. It's very significant, um, very evolved state of consciousness. Um, I, I, I like to think that when entities come and they're scary, I've described it or I heard it once described to me like intuitively they come to scare the fear out of you. So I I framed it in that way. Like, okay, they're coming to help me, scaring the living hell out of me because I've been carrying that fear anyway. It's just they're providing a little bit of context for it to come out. So I could like thank them for doing that in a sense. Um, that was one way I framed it. I had a mantra that I would chant, um, I am the light. I would just remind myself that I'm the light. The light dispels darkness. Darkness cannot, you know, dispel the light. And so I had some interesting dreams and, and mystical sort of visions in which I was having these dark things coming forth. And I just remembered, I'm the light. I'm the light. Come, come at me. Um, and if I, like you're saying, if I remembered that, they would leave. And I felt yeah. like, okay, they, they came to initiate me into this remembrance. I have a direct experience to cultivate like a really integrated form of courage because I've had this experience and I've been through something. This is the ways that I frame those experiences. Um, I love the way that you described there that, you know, there's two paradigms. Yes, there could be the paradigm of entities are separate autonomous beings coming to, you know, uh, bother us, or it could be a darker aspect of ourselves, the unconscious, the shadow, et cetera. And there's two paradigms. And as a healer, uh, as a light worker yourself, you're tactful enough to tune in and see what paradigm was going to suit the person in, in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add on to that by saying that I think that same pair, those same two paradigms apply also to our spirit guides. I don't, think that they're separate beings i think that there are higher aspects of ourselves but when they're when we perceive them as being separate it just makes it a little easier to communicate with them or to trust them maybe we don't trust ourselves so we project it outwards into like a, a separate entity who's now our spirit guide um, but one time you know i was talking to uh a, a, I was, I'll, I'll get your take on this as well but i was actually talking to 
the Kundalini. For many years, I perceived it to be my spirit, my guide, my intuition, my higher self, and I would have a sort of dialogue. And there was a tinge of separateness there. But then one day I was talking to the Kundalini and I heard, who do you keep talking to? I am you. And it closed a little bit of that gap between the separation. So on that, do you have a, a, a sort of dialogue with your guides, with your Kundalini, with God? What's that look like for you? Yeah, yeah, I love what you're saying. I love what you're saying. Um, yeah, it was literally in my head as well to to equate what you said with the Kundalini, with the with the I thou relationship with the Kundalini. So yeah, and I think what you were saying about the entities coming to kind of kick the fear out of you, or, or however you phrased it, we we could we can even you can even bring that. I mean, I absolutely love that. It's beautiful, and you can even bring that into just if you're feeling fear over a situation it's like oh thank you it's, this is a gift that you're showing me where you know it's the same thing so yeah i love that um yeah the i thou relationship with kundalini it's i use the i thou relationship with kundalini but i recognize that it is i'm using it when it's practical for, for me personally i if for a long time it felt more like it was something separate, I too had an have uh, come to a point. It was actually on one of those more recent mushroom experiences that I had. Um, it was something I'd already kind of come to, but it was just really hammering it home because I, I had this experience of this. This has actually been an ongoing thing for me. Um, I've had this fear come up about Kundalini deserting me, like it leaving me half done. That was my fear, and I realized that this was a. Um, this was a fear of like abandonment essentially by God or myself, you know, and I, and obviously intellectually that's ridiculous because you can't be abandoned by that. You can't be abandoned by God. But anyway, that fear, I'd kind of done a bit of work on it, but it came up again in one of these mushroom experiences. And I sat with it and it was like, it just came through of like, this is you. This is like, this, this isn't separate from you. This is you. This is integrated so much into your being. This is you um and so yeah i definitely see that it's just a, it's a part of me but i will use that either relationship with it when it when it's helpful like if i want to talk to kundalini if it's getting a bit intense and maybe i want to just calm it down for a little moment in a certain situation or yeah that's my that's my view with it i yeah. love that yeah but when it's practical yeah exactly yeah, when it's, it's, just it's a tool it's a way of relating to it that, that's helpful at certain times but it's not the absolute truth Got it. Got it. Yeah. I think it helps us because we're wired to communicate with others. And so it helps us in a practical sense to communicate with the aspects of ourselves as if they were separate. But deep down, we know, of course, it's not, but it's as difficult to talk to yourself or, you know, unless you conceptualize it as being somewhat separate. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, if we can shift gears a little bit. So I, I know, um, you know, it, it's come up a little bit in our conversation so far, some of the, uh, the shadow around sexuality and how that was coming up for you came up for me as well. Um, I had quite literal physical pain in my groin area, like unbearable, um, discomfort. And, uh, of course it was healing experiences um, but in particular, the practice of celibacy or a conscious relationship with uh, your sexual energy, um, semen retention. I know these are themes that have come up in some of your work that you've talked about on your channel. They're very relevant themes for me as well. Uh, I, I think they're, along with the psychedelics, along with the meditation, very uh, influential for my own awakening and own process. Can you talk a little bit about what those themes have meant for you? Um, if there's anything, you know, um, that you're comfortable speaking about in terms of uh, your relationship with your sexual energy? Yeah, yeah, sure. So semen retention. Um, yeah, I've got, I think it's, 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 well, I had periods of, especially early on with the Kundalini, of very long periods of semen retention. It wasn't so much like me consciously thinking, oh, I'm going to do this practice. It was just 
the desire was completely gone and it felt like the right thing to do. I think the longest I did was maybe like eight months or something um, early on. And, but then there was periods during the Kundalini awakening where literally the energy would want to move me into like ejaculation and into masturbation. And, and sometimes there'd be periods of doing that quite a lot over a period of short time. So I just tried to cultivate this relationship of trust with the Kundalini. Um, sometimes in those Kriya, sometimes in those Kriya sessions, it would like move into that into that space, um, because some of that was clearing sexual trauma. I think um, some of it was just up, maybe opening up channels. It's just what it needed to do. Um, so yeah, my journey with semen retention has been just a quite an intuitively guided flow with what I felt Kundalini wanted. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in like a relationship now. I, I was celibate for 10 years, basically. No, no sex for 10 years. Um, no relationship for 10 years during that whole journey. And I think that was very valuable for me. I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating 10 years of, of celibacy, but it, it was, it was where my path took me. Um, and I feel like I cleared out a lot of sexual stuff from past relationships. There was unhealthy, unhealthy patterns. Um, there is one thing I, I would say, and I did mention this in one of my videos. I think there's a shadow side to like some of the information that is put out around semen retention and Kundalini awakenings, because at least for me, and this is many, many years ago when I first was scouring the internet for information and in 2010 there was a lot less out there than there is now by a massive amount but I was reading things about saying that if you couldn't have a kundalini awakening if you were ejaculating or if you did ejaculate it might abort the kundalini process and things like that and to me that is total misinformation really uh, as my journey has sh shown to me and I feel it added this layer of like fear around sexuality that I actually needed to work through so I feel like there's definitely benefits to semen retention and and I, and I think if you if you especially if you like addictively ejaculate and a lot that's terrible for any man um and you know I yeah I don't ejaculate like incredibly often um more so being in a relationship but I still work on like some of that practices in a relationship as well um yeah so, so that's kind of my yeah my view on on the semen retention side of things right I, I like that very balanced reasonable approach mm -hmm. because of course uh, many of us come from a religious background that shames us for sexuality yeah and um then we you know it's, stray from that you could say or, or go off and explore and sometimes people can get involved in uh, excessive releases of sexual energy and then they find you know semen retention or the no fat movement yeah also the 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 spiritual material some of the Taoist material some of the the yogi material around these things and and now it's like we've returned back to this very oppressive suppressive militant approach to um you know, our sexual energy. But I, I like your your words there about how it was, you know, just uh, an organic, intuitive flow led by the Kundalini. And your yeah. examples there, I mean, sometimes a Kundalini may have in, in, asked you to have those releases to ejaculate or whatever it was. I think that says a lot because ultimately we want to listen to our own system as opposed to listen to like a a book or some text or some person online you want to listen to what your own system is asking and um, i think the kundalini will can ask us of almost anything i don't think anything is off limits I, I, like in general i mean like you know sometimes it asks people to eat meat and yeah. you know that contradicts what they may have read or heard or thought about diets um i, I think also um if Maybe maybe in cases like yours, for example, where the Kundalini is leading you to have a release, it's it's almost like a protective measure. Potentially, I, I don't know about your experience, but if if some people retain it without the proper uh, means to uh, channel the energy, or at mm -hmm. the certain time in their life they don't have the strength within their nervous system to do so, they can become neurotic. They can lose their mind, and so right. 
the Kundalini knows how to to take care of us. I think if we surrender everything to it and turn even, you know, um uh relate to our sexual energy in a conscious way, that's that's my approach as well. It's nothing is off limits, it's just doing things with consciousness. And so uh, I, I thank you for uh, for opening up there on those those topics. Um a lot of people are are struggling with those things and you know, not many are talking about it, but I know you've got a talk on your channel about uh, some of the the darker sides of uh, the yeah. sexual shadow and whatnot. Yeah. So I invite people to check that out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sexual shadow was, I can just touch on it now a little bit. It was very interesting for me because there was a period of maybe a year or two, I can't quite exactly remember, where at certain times in that, um, just all these sexual thoughts would come up and things that I judged as wrong, basically, and and sexual activities that I had judgments against in some way, um, or at least like like a, a judgment of, oh, that's not me kind of thing. So for like, like for example, like if a homosexual thought or something was like, oh, oh that, you know, like pushing it away. And I, I had to go through this process of, I think I'd read this some, somewhere that, that kind of got me to do this process with it, but it was so, so helpful of just any time anything like that came up, I would just absolutely allow it, move fully into the, allow myself to completely fantasize with it, go completely into it, ejaculate to it if, if that felt right. Um, but I was I was observing it from a point of zero judgment and letting it, letting whatever it was, no matter how weird or freaky or whatever, you know, like I was allowing it that space to exist and be seen and be accepted. And over this period of time, like these things would come up and then that it just like totally passed and like none of that arises in me anymore. It was like this purification period, but in order to purify, and this this works for so many different like emotions in the body, but it, it just needed to, it needed to be acknowledged with love and non-judgment. And that's all it wanted, really. And then it's like, it's been allowed to just move and the Kundalini, whatever it's doing with it. Um, so I think that's really important for people because it's it's a bit simplistic to say Kundalini is sexual energy in a certain way, but it's because I think it's maybe more than that, but it but it's certainly tied in there. And there's a, there's I work with so many clients with Kundalini awakenings who've had certain various degrees of sexual trauma, and maybe that's just completely rampant throughout the whole society. It probably is because sexuality is so repressed in this society. It's it's unbelievable. I don't think it, I mean. I've spoke about this, I think I touched on it in this video, but I think about the some of the very words we use, like the curse words. And if you think about like what a curse is, <laughs> you know, it's like a magical uh, act on something to, you know, cause harm. The vast majority of our curse words are words for our genitals or sexual acts. And so there's this subconscious linguistic programming every time, like this person's a whatever, it's like the self-shaming and the shaming of sexuality continuously going on at a subconscious level embedded in the language. And, and that's just a, a symptom of a, a much deeper suppression of essentially the energy that is creation, that is life, that everything comes into being through sexual, sexual interaction on some level. And it's a beautiful thing. And so I think culturally for us shifting that shame and, and, um, Shadow around sex is one of the biggest things that that, that needs to happen to help us move forward. Um, and unfortunately, some of the spiritual traditions and some of, especially some of the more recent, like monotheistic spiritual traditions are, are very negative towards that energy as well. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, opening up there. There's a lot of value in, especially the practice that you share there of just allowing it to come forth without judgment, whatever it is. And that doesn't mean that whatever's coming forth is wrong and that it's being purged per se. It's just allowing it to be there. It's it's a part of uh, our experience here, whatever those experiences, those those feelings or fantasies even. It's all welcome. Brilliant mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being vulnerable and opening up. I know this is hard stuff to talk about, but uh, important conversations for sure. Because, like you said, um, a lot of a lot of uh, sexual repression and pain and confusion and and uh, all sorts of difficult things in our in our culture and our society. Um, it's where we come from, like you said. 
You know, it, it seems like our culture likes to deny the beginning and the end, sex and death, right? We don't, uh, <laughs> we don't talk about those things. <laughs> it's it's interesting the way that we uh, that we do that, but um, I'm happy that we could talk, and 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 I I, I think uh, we'll see more and more people coming forth, opening up about these things. Uh, so thank you, thank you. So, James. You work as uh, a healer, shamanic yeah. breathwork facilitator. Um, you offer support for those going through Kundalini Awakening. I'm going to get you to share some of your, your insights about that work in particular um, and what it's been like. But how did it begin? Did you just, you know, decide this is what you want to do or, you know, how did it start for you? Yeah, um, it got to a point on my journey after about... Um... So I've been doing this for about three years now. So after about 10 years of the Kundalini process, when I'd say those 10 years were a major hermit phase, I didn't really see that many people for a lot of that time. Um, but it, yeah, it just, it I was starting to feel the call to to come back into the world really and, and, and yeah, trying to figure out what my path was. Um, I've been a musician for many, many years. That was my massive passion before Kundalini. I ended up not being able to play my instrument for seven years because it was so intense. Um, and I, yeah, so on the other side of this hermit phase, I, I, I actually spent a year on the back end of that creating an ambient guitar album, which was kind of imbued with healing intent. Um, and in my, my creative output and the music was so different to what I was doing before. I was in a band before that was somewhat like Rage Against the Machine. And the mm -hmm. music I create now is like this kind of blissful ambient sort of <laughs> heavenly vibes. Um, so yeah, following on from that, I, I felt like maybe I would do sound healing. Um, but I also recognized that this energy was flowing through my body. And and it, so it felt like there was this natural calling to do hands-on healing work as well. Because when I'm in the when I'm doing a healing, uh, like the kundalini energy increases in my body to such a such a degree, and I can feel it like flowing out of the palms and stuff. So there's just this knowing that there was something there as well. I remember asking spirit, like, "Oh, what should I do? I don't know whether I should go this route, go that route." And I had a dream that night, and it's a long story, but to cut the story short, I got taken to this place, and this guide came into the dream and said, "It doesn't matter what you do; what matters is how you do it." And that was very freeing for me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, th that's what happened. And my friend, um, well, basically like somebody uh, in my family, was coincidentally at that time setting up a healing centre, which is the one that I'm going to be taking over of that we mentioned earlier. And so like things just started to open up for me and I moved into it. The shamanic breath work, which is probably my main passion out of all the healings I do, because that's that brings it all together. There's the breathing, there's the hands-on healing throughout, there's the ceremonial aspect. It's if if nobody's done holotropic breathing, which is the type of breathing in, in shamanic breath work, it's practically as close as you can get to without uh, to having a psychedelic experience without taking a psychedelic, in my opinion. And the reason I was drawn to that is synchronistically, I, I got guided to go to some breath work sessions myself. And I had such powerful releases in that of like uh, a lot of anger and sadness because there'd been a relationship thing that had gone on around that time um, that had caused me a lot of issues. Um, and so I recognized the massive Persian potential of it. But the other thing I recognized was that people doing this breath work, it was somewhat mimicking the kind of things that happen in a Kundalini awakening. So yeah. the spontaneous body movements, the kind of vocal expressions, um the the emotional purges and that that just really piqued my interest of like wow this is like this is operating in the same way kundalini has healed me and so that yeah that just really drew me into like wanting to do that for other, other people and yeah i just kind of got on that path from there and, and i think my journey with kundalini and dealing with all that in my own in my own body and all my own emotions and stuff over that sort of 10 year hermit phase gave me a, a real strength to be able to hold that in other people. Like somebody, there's nothing that could come up basically in a, in a breathwork one-to-one -one or a group session that would freak me out or that, you know, that I couldn't hold. Um, 
so yeah that's that was my journey into into that and then i did the hands-on healing as well within that as i said so yeah incredible incredible um like you i used to play in a band like rage against the machine too <laughs> right interesting <laughs> and, uh, yeah things changed we got a lot in common actually yeah things yeah. changed for me i found that uh the uh it served its purpose i got a lot of anger out but eventually i had you know i didn't have anything in me that really wanted to express in those ways so uh i started to listen to uh, a lot of chanting and mantra music and stuff like that now it's so uh similar trajectories i invite uh everybody to check out james's work in the description your website your music it'll all be there um so working with with people that are going through kundalini awakening yeah what are some of the major themes that come up that you see some of the uh most common issues and if you can give some more general advice for those out there, um, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, common themes, I think. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fear associated with the process, especially early on, I think, and feeling completely overwhelmed, misunderstood um there's common themes of like not being able to express it feeling unbelieved by other people not being able to speak to anyone about the experience um i mean i do various degrees of uh depth of healing work in a session depending on the client and, and what they want and where they're at but there's quite a lot of people who just want to talk to somebody who's, who knows what they're talking about you know just just being able to like speak their truth from somebody who understands and listens is like a big part of it because people feel very unheard because it's very marginal and a very misunderstood phenomena or not even not even acknowledged phenomena really not misunderstood it just most people just don't believe it's a real thing or even exists and and i mean it's kind of understandable until you have it it's mind-blowing when this happens it's like i couldn't believe what, what happened to me it was like oh my god um and there's a, there is a lot of stuff with how to how to ground, which I think we've already touched on a little bit earlier. A lot of things to do with yeah, just how how to kind of get through the intensity of the process, um, dealing with the extreme. Because one thing with Kundalini awakening is it can be like any emotion can be felt so strongly in the body that it can completely take over the system. Um, so I think that's like quite a common common theme for people of how to like deal with this, how to integrate those extreme emotions. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of other things, but the, those are the ones that have just come through in the moment. Um, yeah, those uh, are definitely very common themes, right? Um, feeling alone and misunderstood. Um, I, I'm still figuring this out for myself in in the work that I do, but um, just creating a container for people to share and not feel judged. It's so powerful. Um, yeah. It's not that people need a special protocol or something to take away. It's just a space to share and not feel stigmatized or labeled. That's huge. And of course, yeah, feeling overwhelmed by the process. It's a very overwhelming process. It's it's unspeakably powerful. Um, and so those are your support sessions. Now, energy healing, um, do you do that remotely or is that exclusively in person? Um, I do do some energy work within, within remote sessions, but my preference or, or the most common is is doing it in person so i do work with some people with kundalini awakenings doing hands-on healing sessions as well if there's lo those local to, some of those local to me and that can be very very powerful for people um especially like doing just having having that that those that hands-on and what i've found is with people with kundalini awakenings i just like Whenever I'm doing hands-on healing, I'm just like tuning into like the, the Kundalini or just source and just getting out of the way. And it will like during my careers, like my hands have been moved to certain places in my body and done all sorts of things. So the the intelligence is there and I just let let that take over and it'll guide me to where I need to be on their bodies. But I've found with like 
people with Kundalini. It's almost like their Kundalini and my Kundalini, which is one anyway, really, but it kind of sinks and, and there's this process and it really lets them go quite deep and release a lot of stuff. So I've worked with quite a few Kundalini clients in person as well. Um, Great. Fascinating stuff. Um, Once again, the links will be in the description. And, and you mentioned you're in Halifax, United Kingdom, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, in West, in West Yorkshire, yeah. And I think I'll just say as well, because you asked about like, um, in terms of, there's there's a few things that I think are really important for people on the Kundalini journey of like, cultivating a real sense of compassion for yourself, because I think people can really get caught up in um, just fear and judgment of the self. Like this is an incredibly difficult journey and just having that compassion for yourself every step of the way is really, really important. Trust in the process trust trust in trust the process because it knows exactly what it's doing it's divine energy divine intelligence and it knows what it's doing and the more you can get out of the way the easier it's going to be the more smooth it's going to be um and yeah just surrendering into it um and that's can be easier said than done but those like compassion patience was another thing i had to learn surrender you know like yeah they were massive I agree. Yeah, very, very massive, uh, massive themes there. Um, sometimes our, I think we we want like a protocol, a very complicated protocol, but in reality, it's simple things that just take practice. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So you spent 10 years as a hermit, generally speaking. You've come out now and you're, uh, you know, supporting others going through the awakening process, making music, um, you know, you're a healer, among other things, I'm sure. You're back in the world now. I think you you mentioned the, uh, you know, this, this idea of returning. You're back in the world now, feet on the ground. Um, and it seems like this healing center that you're a part of that you're you're um i guess leading putting together yeah. is, is uh is the playground for for your integration and, and your service work so tell us yeah. about what's going on with uh with that project there yeah so me and me and my partner are just about really to take over it we're just starting um there's some building work that some inner building work that still needs to be done but essentially the place is set up for healing center already there's just some stuff we need to do before we reopen um it's a big converted old methodist church there's three floors there's a cafe space and space for retail shops um on the sort of ground floor where you enter uh and there's going to be like an alcohol free bar there um yeah healthy food um then downstairs there is some rooms for for healing spaces there's an infrared sauna there's a float tank there's a small yoga studio downstairs and then the third the, the floor above the, the top floor there's a massive yoga studio uh, and then about 11 healing rooms as well so it's a really big building it's it's a really big project and yeah we're, we're actually i'm just putting together a crowdfunder to try and help us like with with uh, the, some of the costs of setting that up and and um yeah it's it's really exciting it's a really big deal um it feels like there's a little bit of overwhelm at times at the moment because of the scale of it uh but also as i said like really exciting and i think i think these kind of places are really needed in this time i, I hopefully there's going to be more and more of these kind of healing wellness centers set up around the world and I'd love to have this kind of like where where a lot of them are connected in some way, like these little nodes and or like mycelium, like reaching out to all these different connected spaces that, that's going to welcome people who are stepping onto this path and helping them on that journey. Because there's a lot of people more and more just starting to step onto this spiritual path. And, you know, we'd like this this place that, that we're taking on to be like a beautiful a beautiful space that people can come into and learn more and have healing sessions and have group sessions do retreats and just really help shift like the energy on the planet in our own little corner of the of the of the world and yeah that's kind of yeah that's that's the that's the dream of, of it 
Yeah, that sounds like uh, the light worker's dream right there. Um, <laughs> big project, but I'm sure a lot uh, of growth is happening there and a lot of growth will come out of it for many others. So yeah. uh, I'm excited to follow along with your journey with that. Um, I'm curious if you feel any sort of synchronicity and flow and grace supporting you through this project yeah yeah absolutely i mean i feel like it is early days for us it's literally like a matter of about about four weeks since we took over um, but i have been involved in the project for the last two years and yeah there's been there's been many challenges of like community forming around there and how people interact and um yeah, when, when people come together in community, it's it brings things up and that's part of the journey and you've got to learn how to work with... I, th I feel like there's these layers. There's like our own inner, inner journey that we can do like the hermit kind of thing. Then there's another layer when you're in relationship with another being. And then there's a broader layer with the, with, with the family and then the community. And they, these all bring up different cha challenges. Um, but yeah, great rewards as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of the flow and the grace, I mean, I feel like that's just been massive for me as all the way along from, from before Kundalini work, like there was constant guidance from the universe showing me that this what it was like following the little signs to lead me down the path. There's there's been times when the synchronicities have led me to um let's say like dead ends maybe in places that I didn't quite understand why it was taking me there, but uh, or, pl or, or places that ended up me feeling like quite a lot of emotional turbulence and trauma from, but I guess that was, that was where it needed to lead me as well at that time. Uh, but yeah, things have just fallen into place. Like, like I said, when I came out of that healing space for someone, um, basically my family is like my uh, brother's wife's brother <laughs> um, was part of the original people who set that place up that was just being set up as i was just at this point and then the breath work just unfolded completely naturally the way me and my partner met was, was all synchronicity and then it just so happened that like the the owners didn't want to be doing that anymore and we were kind of together and just all these things just flowed in this right pattern to sort of get it get us to where we are right now so i definitely feel that hand of grace like moving through it um there's still some parts of me that like sometimes don't always trust you know like i have these little shadow parts that still come up even now after many years on this path and <laughs> witnessing all that uh stuff but sometimes yeah sometimes little fears still come up and that's just a lesson to sit with that and kind of work with that and integrate it and still move forward for sure i i really love that you mentioned that because yeah just like for me, even this work in particular, a lot of synchronicity and, and support to just come like just being in the flow. But there are times where I can look back and like, what am I doing? Like, what the heck is going on? And I have to take pause and look and think, well, all of these different events lined up in order for this to happen. And so I'm not at the end, it's I'm in the middle and and that's why it feels confusing and I have to keep going because whatever supported me this far, it's not going to abandon me. Whatever supported you, you know, brought you and your partner together and lined up the timing and the conversations, it's not going to abandon you uh, once you got to, you know, pay bills for the rent or whatever yeah. it is, right? It's going to take care of you. It only makes sense. That's a great uh, example, James. Your Your whole story is a great example of going through the difficulty of Kundalini. Um healing and then coming out and sharing your gifts with others and i think that alone is very inspiring to some people myself included because many in the middle of the process you know uh, they may think that their whole life is just now a big healing purging you know uh, uh like almost like they're ill yeah. But I like to think that, uh, you know, we go through this process for a reason um, to come out to a point where we're stable, where we can then begin to support others through their their own uh, journeys. And in your case, it's as obviously a, a light worker, a healer, 
for others, it may be in more, um, you know, I like to say incognito ways. Yeah, sure. But Kundalini doesn't happen to us for, for no reason. It's so that we can be put to work, I think. And yeah. uh, I, I thank you for, for your courage, you know, going through this journey for, you know, I guess you said 13 years since Kundalini Awakening, but it's been your whole life, past lives even. So uh, I'm excited to see how things unfold with you in the center and and as your work grows and, and your your reach grows. Um, so with that said, where can people connect with you? And uh, even if you have to repeat yourself, briefly go over again what some of your offerings are. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll just say one quick thing before I do that as well. I think it's important as well, like like you just said, like maybe more incognito, somebody might be... be and just tapping back into the message that I got in that dream, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is how you do it. Love it. You can be sitting in a supermarket on a, a checkout till just going, and if you are emanating that frequency and that vibration and having beautiful interaction with every being that crosses your path, then that is changing this reality as well. That is changing this world. And that, you know, it's like everybody's got their own little beautiful role and it's it's the sort of vibration and energy you do it with that's what really matters not what you what exactly thing you're doing in the yeah so beautiful yeah. yeah um yeah so i offer i'm a musician as we've said i've got a couple of albums out they're available to download on bandcamp uh or they're also on the streaming sites as well and i do shamanic breath work. I do one on one shamanic breath work, group shamanic breath works. I do those group ones with my partner. We do them uh, around the north of England. And we also have been doing them at some like holistic festivals and retreats and things like that. And I do one to one energy healing and then guided sessions for people going through Kundalini awakenings. Um, I also offer sessions with the Liber light, the guy who creates those lights I'm, I've become friends with. And that's like a, one of those lights that creates a DMT like experience um, or a meditative experience from this uh, light bath experience. Um, and I do some, I do some uh, sound healing with him at some events as well. Um, and yeah, and all that information can be found on my website, which is jamesdeardenbush.com. And Dearden is like D-E-A-R-D-E-N. But yeah, you can see the link in the description. Awesome. So that'll be uh, in the description for sure. As well, you're on Instagram, um, YouTube, of course, you've got some great talks on YouTube, uh, some some great insight and wisdom from your uh, from your many years on the path, many years serving people. Um, I invite everybody to check out James work, reach out uh, if you're looking for some support. Um, and, uh, you know, if you find yourself in the UK, maybe you can uh, attend one of his events maybe drop by uh the center and uh see what it's all about james thank you so much this has been a really incredible conversation i got a lot out of it i'm happy that we got to connect i really appreciate your time today um for all those out there that spent some time with us thank you all as well uh i can't thank you enough for the support for this this work for your attention it means so much james it's yeah, been a pleasure you much. You. much love and peace. Sure.